Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, Teacher Liz, here, your host once more for this episode of Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day program. It's Monday, so of course I have new observances, history lessons, animals and plants to see, a new place to explore, and of course some Spanish words to learn. And be sure you're logging in for the Zoom sessions provided to you every day by the Discovery Educational Team. So let's not delay anymore. Let's start the show. And now for our daily observances. Hey Discovery Learners, it's Substitute Teacher Andrew again, bringing you today's observances. Our first observance is National Caramel Day. Us caramel lovers celebrate their favorite treat on National Caramel Day each year on April 5th. This versatile confection adds delicious creamy flavor to any dessert, pastry, or candy it's added to. Caramels are made by adding milk and fat to a sugar syrup that has been heated and continuously stirred until it reaches a light brown color. As early as the 17th century, American women used caramel sugar and water to make candies. Since it was economical candy to produce, it found its way into many recipes. Around the year 1850, someone discovered that adding milk and fat to the product could make a soft, chewy candy. It should be no surprise how quickly soft caramel became popular. Bakers and pastry chefs used caramel to make a variety of desserts, either as a featured ingredient, flavoring, or topping. Depending upon the consistency, it can be used as a syrup or a glue that holds together nuts and popcorn. In a more pliant form, the candy makes great caramel apples. Cooked at a higher temperature, the caramel can become brittle and is perfect for just that kind of candy. The longer caramel cooks, it takes on a deeper color and darker flavor until the sugar becomes bitter and is no longer palatable, which would be kind of sad. I hate wasting caramel. Or do you guys call it caramel? That's a big debate too. Let us know in the comment section below what your favorite caramel or caramel candy is. Our next observance is National Raisin and Spice Bar Day. Observed annually on April 5th, National Raisin and Spice Bar Day celebrates a baked treat that's easy to make. Sometimes comfort foods can come in the form of raisins and spice fresh from the oven. Bakers offer a variety of ways to make these delicious bars. If you like nuts, add nuts. If you don't like nuts or are allergic, well, leave them out. For those who love vanilla, accidentally tip the bottle a second too long. Someone might think your bars are the best. I love vanilla, and I'm allergic to cashews, so that would be perfect for me. You can also add powdered sugar or drizzle some icing over the top of these bars for additional sweetness. However, most would agree these bars are naturally sweet, with raisins complemented by cinnamon. They're terrific just as they are. The warm spices in the dish fill our homes with welcoming scents like no other. For generations, cinnamon along with nutmeg and allspice have elicited fond memories of this holiday family favorite. I think when they say sugar and spice and everything nice, the everything nice must be raisins. How can you observe National Raisin and Spice Day? Well, you can go to the store and buy some store-bought, or you can pause the video right here and take a look at the recipe and try to make your own at home. Let us know in the comment section below what you plan to do. Our next observance is National Deep Dish Pizza Day. On April 5th, National Deep Dish Pizza Day gives pizza lovers a chance to celebrate one of America's favorite varieties of pizza. Whether it's dine-in, delivered, takeout, or homemade, deep dish pizza satisfies pizza lovers all across the country. Pick whatever toppings you like. This day focuses on the deep crust that holds the amazing amount of sauce and toppings. Like other styles of pizza, the deep dish menu offers a variety of combinations to choose from. If you prefer an all-meat pizza, the deep dish makes it. Top it with vegetables galore or order extra mushrooms, deep dish pizza can manage. In ancient Greece, the Greeks covered their bread with oils, herbs, and cheese, which some people believe was the beginning of pizza. A sheet of dough topped with cheese and honey, then flavored with bay leaves was developed by the Romans. The modern pizza had its beginnings in Italy as a Neapolitan flatbread. The original pizza used only mozzarella cheese. 
mainly the highest quality of buffalo mozzarella variant which was produced in the area surrounding Naples. It was estimated that the annual production of pizza cheese in the United States in 1997 was 2 billion pounds. The first United States pizza establishment opened up in 1905 in New York's Little Italy. Pizza has become one of America's most favorite meals and one of my personal favorites. Although, truth be told, I like thin crust. But if you like deep dish, what kind of deep dish? Chicago? Detroit? Let us know in the comment section below your perfect pizza pie toppings. Today's last observance is National Reader Roadmap Day. National Reader Roadmap Day is celebrated today on April 5th that challenged us to test our cartography skills. The earliest roadmap, the Britannia Atlas, was drawn by a cartographer, John Ogilvy, in 1675. Fast forward a few centuries, and things have changed a great deal. We now have satellites called Global Positioning Satellites, or GPS, with voice commands. Things have gotten really advanced, but because of that advancement, a lot of us have forgotten how to use roadmaps. I know I used to use roadmaps up until I lost my compass. Roadmaps are still a useful tool. Should batteries run low or a satellite connection be lost, we'll need to rely on the current roadmaps that keep us on course. This day reminds us to take some time to sharpen those map reading skills. Take notice of your surroundings. Do you know north from east? If not, well it's a good time to learn. Let us know in the comment section below if you know how to read a roadmap. Go ahead and comment down below and let us know how you plan on observing, well, these observances for today. On this day in history, today in 1987, the Fox TV network premieres Married with Children. Married with Children is an American TV sitcom created by Michael G. Moy and Ron Leavitt for Fox Broadcasting Company. Originally broadcast from April 5th, 1987 to June 9th, 1997. It's longest lasting live action sitcom on Fox and the first to be broadcast in the network's primetime slot. In addition, the show's original run, one episode that was not screened on Fox when originally aired on January 6, 1989, was aired on FX on June 18, 2002, five years after the series' conclusion. The show follows a suburban Chicago lives of Al Bundy, a once glorious high school football player turned hard luck woman shoe salesman, his lazy wife Peggy, their beautiful yet dumb and popular daughter Kelly, and their smart and unpopular son Bud. The series comprises 259 episodes in 11 seasons. Its theme song, Love and Marriage, was by Sammy Kong and Jimmy Van Housen, performed by Frank Sinatra from the 1955 television production Our Town. I remember watching this show when I was younger. I remember not understanding the jokes, but as an adult, I do now. What about you? Have you ever seen the show? Go ahead and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Go ahead and leave a comment below and let us know what you think of today's historical events. Notable figures born on this day. Our first notable figure born today is Gregory Peck, born April 5th, 1916 in San Diego, California. This famous American actor played Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, a role that earned him an Academy Award for Best Actor. As one of the top actors in the 40s and 50s, he starred in Keys of the Kingdom and A Gentleman's Agreement. Before he was famous, while attending college, he was employed as a truck driver for an oil company. Following his graduation from Berkeley with an English degree, he moved to New York and studied under Sanford Meisner. He unfortunately passed away June 12, 2003 at the age of 87. But a little piece of trivia to know about him is, he was nominated for an Academy Award four times in the first five years of his film acting career. Wow! Happy birthday, Gregory! Our next notable figure born today is Akira Toriyama, born April 5th, 1955 in Nagoya, Japan. 
This Japanese manga and game artist is known for his work in the manga series Dr. Slump from 1980 until 1984 and, most famously, Dragon Ball. From 1984 until 1995, his work on Dr. Slump earned him in 1981 Shogun Kukan Manga Award. Before he was famous, he won an amateur manga competition sponsored by Jump Magazine and went on to publish his first professional work in 1978. He designed posters for a Nagoya advertising agency for three years. He also served as a character designer for the game Dragon Quest. Wow, I could totally see that. Those characters do look a lot like Dragon Ball. He turns 66 years old today. Happy birthday, Akira. Another notable figure born today is Christopher Reed, born April 5th, 1964, in Bronx, New York. This American actor and rapper was the kid of The Kid in Play, the late 1980s hip hop group whose 1990 album Funhouse reached the number 58 position on the Billboard Top 200 and went gold two years later. Also, an actor, he starred in the House Party movie series. Before he was famous, he grew up in the Bronx, where he attended both high school and college. And a few years ago, he appeared in LMFAO's video Sorry for Party Rocking. He turns 57 years old today. Happy birthday, Christopher. And our last notable figure born today is Pharrell Williams. Born April 5th, 1973, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. This American singer, rapper, and music producer, who is one half of the record production duo The Neptunes and the lead vocalist of the hip hop band NERD. He was nominated for an Academy Award in 2014 for penning the song Happy for the film Despicable Me 2. Before he was famous, He played in high school band. He also won a Grammy with rapper Ludacris in 2007 for best rap song for Moneymaker. He turns 48 years old today. Happy birthday, Pharrell! Happy birthday, everyone! Come along as we take a journey to the place of the week. This week we are traveling to Egypt. And do you hear that? In the background? That's the Egyptian national anthem. As you listen to it, let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about the Egyptian flag. This nation's flag is horizontally striped red, white, and black. With a central coat of arms in the form of a gold eagle. Hmm, pretty interesting. There isn't any real meaning for the colors on the flag, but the golden eagle is supposed to represent the Arab liberation, which is an agreement of peace throughout the other Arab nations in this region. This current iteration of the Egyptian flag has been in use since 1972. Hmm, pretty interesting looking. Let's go ahead and learn some more about Egypt. Egypt is a country located in the northeastern corner of the continent of Africa. Egypt's land frontiers border Libya to the west, Sudan to the south, and Israel to the northeast. Egypt's official name is Arab Republic of Egypt, and its form of government? Is a multi party republic with two legislative houses the House of Representatives and Senate. Its head of state is a president, and it also has a prime minister. Its capital is Cairo, and the official language of Egypt is Arabic. The most popular religion in Egypt is Islam. Egypt's main monetary unit is The Egyptian pound. 15 Egyptian pounds equals 1 US dollar. The current population of Egypt is 
690,000 people. Egypt has a total area of 390,121 square miles. That happens to be larger than Texas, but about half the size of the U.S. state of Alaska. The main exports out of Egypt are natural gas, cotton, medical and petrochemical products, and construction materials. Three major money-making industries in Egypt are agriculture, manufacturing, and textiles. Wow, and Egypt seems like a pretty interesting place. It also looks ancient and mysterious with all those pyramids and ruin. Can't wait to teach you more. So be sure to stay tuned all week long to Ability to Learn as we teach you more about Egypt. Wow, now that's a really interesting place of the week. Here is the animal of the day. Today's animal is the Sphinx. The Sphinx is a type of domestic cat that originates from Canada. It has been created during the 1960s after the birth of the first naked cat in 1966. Lack of its fur is a result of gene manipulation that occurs every 25 years. The Sphinx is not the only breed of hairless cat, but it is a very popular and widely spread one. Despite the high price of this breed, the Sphinx was the 8th most popular type of cat in America in 2014. The Sphinx is a medium sized cat that can reach 6 to 12 pounds in weight. Even though its body appears hairless, the Sphinx is actually covered with a thin layer of downy hair that looks like peach fuzz. Just like short hair and long hair cats, its skin is covered with various dark markings, spots, points like tabby cats or other patterns. And despite its lack of fur, the Sphinx is not a hypoallergenic cat. Its saliva and skin are a source of protein that can trigger allergic reactions in people who are sensitive to these allergies. The Sphinx has a wedge-shaped head, a narrow face without whiskers, well-developed cheeks, large eyes, and large bat-like ears. It has a slender, muscular body and a whip-like tail. Sphinx has dexterous toes that can be used for manipulation of various objects. And you probably already guessed it, but the Sphinx is named after its sleek body which resembles the Egyptian Sphinx. The Sphinx has 4 degree warmer body compared with other cats. The Sphinx constantly rubs its body against the body of its owner to maintain its body temperature. For that same reason, it often sleeps with its owner too. Sphinx also consume two to two and a half times more food than other breeds of cats because it needs to generate and maintain body heat, unlike the other cats who have fur to maintain the temperature. Sphinx are sweet, affectionate, cuddly, and playful cats that enjoy the company of people, other cats, and cat-friendly dogs. Sphinx are suitable for life in apartments. When it's left on its own, it usually spends time in the warmest part of the house, usually close to sunny windows. Sphinx should be kept in the house during the hottest part of the day to prevent sunburns. Their lack of fur is why they don't like extreme heat or cold. Sphinx require weekly bathing to eliminate oil and dirt collected on their skin. It can hardly clean itself due to the numerous wrinkles on the skin. The Sphinx has an average litter size of 4 to 6 kittens. The Sphinx is a generally healthy breed, but it can suffer from some skin cancers and cardiac disorders. The Sphinx has an average lifespan of 9 to 15 years. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Most pure breed pets don't live that long. The Sphinx are a pretty interesting breed. I actually learned quite a few things about them. Did you learn anything new about the Sphinx, Discovery Learners? Let us know in the comment section below. So what do you think of today's animal? Is it cute? Is it creepy? Go ahead and let us know what you think in the comment section below. The plant of the day. The plant of the day is the papyrus. The papyrus is a species of aquatic flowering plant. It is a tender, herbaceous, perennial plant that's native to Africa and forms tall strands of reed-like swamp vegetation in shallow water. The papyrus sedge and its close relatives have a very long history of use by humans, notably by ancient Egyptians. It is the source of papyrus paper, one of the first types of paper that was ever made. Parts of the plant can be eaten and our highly buoyant stems can be made into boats. It's now often cultivated as an ornamental plant. In nature, it grows in full sun, in flooded swamps, or on lakes, in margins throughout Africa, Madagascar, and the Mediterranean countries. 
This tall, robust, leafless aquatic plant can grow 13 to 16 feet high. It forms in grass-like clumps of triangular green stems that rise from thick, woody rhizomes. Each stem is topped by a dense cluster of thin, bright green, thread-like rays around 10 to 30 centimeters, or 4 to 10 inches in length, resembling a feather duster. Greenish-brown flower clusters eventually appear at the ends of the rays, giving way to brown nut-like fruits. The younger parts of the rhizome are covered with red-brown, papery, triangular scales, which also cover the base of the clumps. Botanically, these represent reduced leaves, so it's strictly not correct to call this plant fully leafless. Papyrus can be found in tropical rainforests, tolerating annual temperatures of 68 to 86 degrees. It flowers late in the summer and prefers full sun to partially shady conditions. Like most tropical plants, it's sensitive to frost. In the United States, it has become invasive in Florida and has escaped from cultivation in Louisiana, California, and Hawaii. The papyrus plant is a relatively easy plant to grow from seed, though in Egypt it is more common to split the rootstock, and it grows quite fast once established. In ancient Egypt, papyrus was used for various purposes, such as baskets, sandals, blankets, medicine, incense, and boats. The woody root was used to make bowls and utensils, and it was burned for fuel. That's pretty interesting. I didn't know that the first paper used was made from papyrus. What interesting facts did you learn about today's plant? Let us know in the comment section below. It's that time again. We just learned about a new plant. So go ahead and tell us what you think in the comment section below. And now for the word of the day. Today's word is hieroglyph. It's a noun. It means a stylized picture of an object representing a word, syllable, or sound, as found in ancient Egyptian and other writing systems. Hieroglyph. Our next word is a word you may have heard somewhere in today's episode. That word is ruins. It's a noun. It means the physical destruction or disintegration of something, or the state of disintegrating or being destroyed. The remains of a building, typically an old one, that has suffered much damage or disintegration. Ruins. Hola, Discovery Learners. So yo, tu maestra Liz. Hello, Discovery Learners. It is I, your teacher Liz. And, este es tu español, la palabra de la semana. What that means is, here's your Spanish word of the week. Su palabra para esta semana es, primavera, 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 which means, spring, primavera, spring. Primavera, spring, as in the season. You can use this word in a phrase. You can say, Me gusta la primavera. Me gusta la primavera. Me gusta la primavera, which means, I like the spring. Me gusta la primavera. I like the spring. Me gusta la primavera. I like the spring. Go ahead and practice speaking Spanish all week long by saying, Me gusta la primavera, which means, I like the spring. Hasta la semana que viene, Discovery Learners. Be sure to tune in next Monday to learn another Spanish word of the week right here on Ability to Learn. Hey Discovery Learners, it's me Andrew Lancaster here with a new list of springtime movies to watch this week. Our first movie is The Lego Movie 2. This comedy is rated PG and comes from the year 2019. It has a 1 hour and 47 minute runtime. It stars Chris Pratt and Elizabeth Banks and can be found on YouTube. Up next is A Little Princess. This family drama is rated G. From 1995, it has a 1 hour and 37 minute runtime and is available on Hulu. Next up is Epic. 
This family adventure has a rating of PG and comes from the year 2013. It has a 1 hour and 42 minute runtime and stars Josh Hutcherson and Beyonce. If you're looking for it, it can be found on Disney+. Plus. Let's take a deeper look at this cinematic work of art. This week's cinematic work of art couldn't come at a better time since we're learning about Egypt. It's The Mummy. It was directed by Stephen Summers. Music was composed by Jerry Goldsmith. It stars Brendan Fraser as Rick O'Connell, Rachel Wise as Evelyn, and Arnold Voslo as Imhotep, and can be found on Hulu. The Mummy. So much can be said about this modern classic. Not only did it have some of the day's brightest stars, but it successfully utilized CGI graphics to enhance its many practical effects. Many of these techniques are still used today. They were one of the first films to use motion capture imagery. Never before has a film used CGI to make magic real on the silver screen in such a way to capture the minds and imaginations of generations to come. The music manages to enhance the suspense that completes the immersion of the world built by the movie. 22 years later and I still get chills watching it. The magic will last forever, making this a cinematic work of art. This PG adventure film comes from 1999. It has a 2 hour and 5 minute runtime, even if you are on the wrong side of the river. Here is today's interesting fact. Did you know that birthstones and their meanings was officially set by Sears, the department store? <laughs> it's true. Well, what are birthstones? Birthstones are gems that are associated with your birth month. Each stone has a unique meaning and significance. Just like horoscope signs, when someone asks you what's your birthstone, they almost always know the answer. Today, you'll commonly see birthstones in jewelry pieces like necklaces, bracelets, rings, or earrings as reminders to celebrate your birth month all year long. Besides jewelry, birthstones are the colors symbolizing the stones show up in many types of gifts and keepsakes, making birthday shopping easy and fun. Birthstones are a part of modern society and since ancient times, it is widely believed that wearing your birthstone is a symbol of wellness and good fortune. Well, how did this all start with the birthstones in different colors? Well, Christian scholars in the 5th century made the connection between the 12 gems in the birthstone, the 12 gems in the breastplate of Aaron, 12 months of the year, and the 12 signs of the zodiac. They theorized that each gem connected to a certain month or astrological alignment and that they would receive therapeutic benefits for wearing one during that time. For example, to receive the full benefit, people took to wearing one stone for each month of the year and attributed a different meaning and value to them. Eventually, this practice was modified so that a person who only wore a stone for the month they were born in, hence the term birthstone. There is a great amount of disagreement over which stone represents the calendar month until 1912 when Sears that's right, the department store, published an official list of birthstones and months they represented. Since then, there have been few modifications here and there, but the list still largely remains unchanged. So yeah, Sears, the department store, kinda set the rules for birthstones. Pretty interesting, huh? We all know what that song means. It means we reached the end of today's episode of Ability to Learn. I had fun, and I hope you had fun too. But not only had fun, I hope you learned something as well. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you're notified for all the fun here on Ability to Learn from the Discovery Day Program. This is Teacher Liz signing out. Farewell, Discovery Learners. I will see you next time.